Hato, hello, and welcome to the National Museum of the American Indians 2021 Teacher Institute. Thank you for joining us. I'm Renee Goki, and I'm the Teacher Services Coordinator at the museum. I'm also a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma and a member of the Turtle Clan. Today, we'll be covering the human side of removal, allotment, and assimilation. Now, in our programs, we generally start with a land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. For many Indigenous people, belonging is deeply tied to ancestral homelands through relationships with the environment, through memories and cultural experiences lived over millennia. In the United States, people are increasingly doing land acknowledgements today, which can be spoken or written and are meant to recognize that Indigenous peoples are the original stewards of the lands on which we now live and work. These acknowledgements should be motivated by genuine respect for and support of Native peoples. They are a first step in creating collaborative, accountable, and respectful relationships with Indigenous nations and communities. Many of you may already do land acknowledgements in your classroom. For those of you who may be looking for some guidance, the museum has developed a one-page handout, which will be placed in the chat. I mentioned earlier that I work at the National Museum of the American Indian, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution, a complex of museums, libraries, zoos, and research centers. We have two exhibition locations in Washington, DC, on the left of your screen, on the National Mall, and also in New York City, which you see in the center, which is in Lower Manhattan. The Cultural Resources Center, which you see on the right, is where we steward material collections in our care, such as photographs, cultural ancestral items, contemporary art, and paper archives. <clears throat> now, central to the museum's mission are strategic partnerships with Native people and with our allies. Collaborations with classrooms across the country is important for our continued efforts to share more complete narratives about Native Americans and to advance our goal to foster a more informed understanding of Native people. Our newly adopted vision statement works towards equity and social justice through education, inspiration, and empowerment. We feel honored to work in education with committed educators like yourselves, and it's so good to see you today. The work of our national education initiative called Native Knowledge 360 is at the heart of our work to make social justice rights become a reality. NK360 seeks to transform teaching and learning about Native Americans by informing, supporting, and empowering you, our educators, to have the tools that you need to bring more complete narratives about Native Americans into your classroom. Fundamental to NK360 are our essential understandings about American Indians document. Now this framework was uh, developed in, through collaboration with Native communities, with national and state education agencies, and with educators from around the country to develop this framework for essential understandings and key concepts that we hope you will carry into your classroom. And we call these EUs for short. The EUs are for an alternative to typical narratives and they equip educators with language and a conceptual framework for thinking about how to construct student learning experiences about Native people. The EUs serve as the foundation for our museum's educational work and we hope that they'll be a foundational document for you. One of our goals today includes an overview of the removal, assimilation, and allotment periods of federal policy so that you have a better understanding of the effects of those policies, both past and present. The second goal is for you to understand the impacts of these policies on a human level by hearing personal accounts and Native perspectives on the eras by our two presenters today. Finally, we hope you feel moved and inspired to teach about these eras in your classroom. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Candessa Tihi, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She serves as Associate Professor in the Department of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies and as Coordinator of Cherokee Language Education and Cultural Studies programs at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Prior to joining the NSU faculty, she served as Executive Director of the Cherokee Heritage Center in Park Hill, Oklahoma, and she was manager of the Cherokee Language Program within Cherokee Nation. 
She earned a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Oklahoma, and she now focuses on Cherokee and indigenous language revitalization, Southeastern indigenous art, and the politics of Cherokee identity. So she is a very busy lady. She's also a textile artist and recognized as a Cherokee national treasure for her skill and artistry in oblique and work-based finger weaving. She was raised in Cherokee Nation and she descends from the Locust, Teehee, Pumpkin, and Macklemore families. Please join me in welcoming Candessa. Widow Renee, Osio Nigadwu, Kandesa Tihi Tawato Yoneg Aseno Ia Gawoseho. In English, my name is Kandesa Tihi, and in Cherokee, everyone calls me Pumpkin. I live in Tahlequah and I work at Northeastern State University, and today I will be talking about the removal era in American history. The title of this talk is The Geji Ilustana Agishli Gesei. And that means that the trail of tears was agony. That word, the Geji Ilustana, it means that we were driven against our will. And that's the Cherokee word that we use for the trail of tears. I'll give a brief overview and focus on some selected tribal, federal, and state actions prior to removal. And I will also talk about the period of removal itself. So to understand the relationship between Indian nations and the U.S. government, we must look at the ebbs and flows in American history. Ada Pecos Melton and Jerry Gardner state, there's a pendulum, a federal policy swing between Indian self-determination with an emphasis on respecting tribal sovereignty and tribal self-government and Indian termination with an emphasis upon terminating Indian nations in order to assimilate their members in dominant society. So as we look at the actions that led to removal and the removal era, we can clearly see where the pendulum of federal policy was at that moment. The seeds for Indian removal were sown early. As many as three decades prior to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, President Thomas Jefferson articulated a policy of Indian removal to clear lands in the East for white settlement with the idea that land west of the Mississippi would be Indian country or Indian territory. There was absolutely no consideration given for the indigenous peoples who were living in the Great Plains when there was the thought of clearing the southeastern Indian United States of its indigenous people and transplanting them to a place where people already lived. So as stated on the previous slide, Jefferson envisioned that proposed ethnic cleansing as a process where indigenous peoples would leave their homelands voluntarily. So as more and more encroachment occurred on indigenous lands, clashes between indigenous people and settlers became more frequent. During this time, states began clamoring for Indian removal, and we see official state action from Georgia pressuring for removal of all Indians from within its borders. Of course, with the notion that it would be peaceably um, happening. Of course, peaceably, you know, that's all a, that's all a perspective of, I guess, the, beho the beholder. Um, I'm including a piece here from the late Eastern Bend Cherokee artist Shan Gosshorn titled All They Could See in Blue Mountains Was Gold. This piece juxtaposes the contradictory perspectives of indigenous people and white settlers as they're looking at the same lands. Um, Shan used paper splints and imagery to create a traditional Cherokee style double wall basket that, 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 that very cleverly juxtaposes these two images. So during this time, because of rapidly increasing pressures, there were Indian peoples who fled west of the Mississippi to escape inevitable white encroachment. Uh, Cherokee people known as old settlers actually began immigrating to the west as early as 1782 and began formally moving to what was then Indian territory in 1828 and 1829. Oral history in my own family says that forced removal was seen as, inevit as an inevitable event that would be full of tragedy. 
So the original Cherokee homelands are located in the east, and they once encompassed parts of present-day North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, we can see that the original Cherokee land was fairly vast, as indicated by the number of current present-day states that it encompassed. Um, at Revolution, at the American Revolution, that land had actually uh, shrunk in size. And then at the time of the final land session, um, there was a vast amount of territory that had been seized by the American government, relegating Cherokee people to but a small fraction of their original territories. So the original Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830, and the Treaty of New Echota was signed into law in 1835. But as I mentioned, calls for removal were made as many as three decades prior. And there is there, there was enormous resistance from within um, Indian communities, from within indigenous nations, to the prospect of removal. Um, as an example, in May 1817, a group of women led by Nancy Ward, renowned beloved woman, um, argued against any land sessions or immigrations. Nancy Ward and the women of the Women's Council stated that Cherokee ladies now being present at the meeting of chiefs and warriors in council thought it their duty as mothers to address their beloved chiefs and warriors. We have raised you all on the land which we now have, which God gave us to inhabit and raise provisions. Your mothers and your sisters ask and beg of you not to part with any of our land. So, um, this was in response to the Treaty of 1817, which was signed in July and ceded 2.2 million acres. So the treaty gave people a choice. They could either accept an allotment and destroy communal land title or move to Arkansas. So Cherokee people logically decided that if they didn't make a choice, then the treaty was not valid because the choice was inherent there. Now, this was, of course, uh, contradicted by the U.S. government, and the treaty was upheld. Um, however, what this shows is the strength of women's voices at this period in time and the deep opposition to removal and to land sessions that existed within Cherokee and other indigenous communities throughout the Southeast. So now as we are looking at these land sessions and the ways in which people were responding to these land sessions, I turn to the memoir of Zilla Haney Brandon. Um, so as Cherokee land sessions were increasing and pressure for Indian removal continued to mount, this excerpt from this memoir shows the perspective of a white settler as they are taking hold of indigenous lands and the improvements that were made by indigenous people on those same lands. So Brandon writes here that her family found a family of Indians occupying our house. And that is the, that, that is the uh, verbiage that she uses there in her memoir. She goes on to critique the house, the state of the house, and to call the Indian people haughty and proud, comparing them to English royalty and, uh, in, in the way that they regard her family taking possession of their home and their lands. Um, she does go on to write, if you continue to read within her memoir, that she felt sympathy for the Cherokee people whom she had displaced from their home. And it may comfort you to know that um, she received that home with a grateful heart, which I find bitterly ironic when viewed from the perspective of the Cherokees who were being displaced. Her family did keep treasured mementos of bows and blowguns given to her family by those same Cherokees when the time for removal did come. The What was then Indian Territory um, was thought of really as the Great American Desert as it was part of the Great Plains. And as I mentioned, there was little to no thought given to the indigenous people who inhabited the Great Plains as those individuals from the southeastern United States were being displaced to the Great Plains, which was the ancestral homeland of a number of indigenous people. Uh, there was immediate and sustained warfare between those groups, and I, I mention this to try and highlight the 
the deep complexities that were being engendered with the creation of Indian Territory and um, the removal of indigenous peoples from the southeastern United States and the eastern seaboard. So between the American Revolution and what Mooney terms the final land session, Cherokee people known as old settlers were moving, um, I, I, you know, I, I'll use air quotes here, voluntarily to what was uh, then Indian Territory uh, west of the Mississippi as early as 1782. So that 2.2 million acre land session in the Treaty of 1817 Spring Frog was one of the signatories on that treaty of 1817 and is depicted um, in a painting. So these immigrations uh, continued with formal moves to Indian Territory beginning in, or I'm sorry, 1828 and 1829. But despite these early immigrations, the vast majority of Cherokees were averse to trading their homelands in the East for lands in the West, despite mounting political pressures from all sides. I, I really want people to understand that even though the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was the what was kind of a specific flashpoint at this moment in history, that this um, that that the pressures on Indian peoples on indigenous nations in the southeastern United States and throughout the eastern seaboard were intense and did not begin in 1830. There is a long history of uh, white encroachment on, on, in, on the lands of indigenous nations. And this is a depiction of Spring Frog, who was a signatory on that treaty of 1817 and an early immigrant to what is what was then Indian Territory. So while the Trail of Tears and Indian removal are almost synonymous with Cherokee people, it would be more appropriate to say that there were trails of tears in the plural. Because many indigenous nations were removed to Indian territory, as this map shows the wide range of geographical origins as this map shows the wide range of geographical origins for tribal nations located in what is currently Oklahoma. So that term, that we were rounded up against our will, we were uh, almost like cattle is, uh, is one way to perhaps phrase that as well. It applies to more than just Cherokee people. It implies to all of the indigenous people who suffered um, trails of tears in their relocation to what is currently Oklahoma. So there were actually 78, I'm sorry, 76. Uh, Peter Nabokov states that from 1860 to 1850, over 100,000 Native Americans that formed 28 tribes would be deported west of the Great Waters or west of the Mississippi. So as waves of these groups came westward, um, they were met with resentment from culturally different Indian peoples for whose homelands they were the, the new immigrants. This is a piece titled Our Father uh, by Cherokee artist Roy Boney Jr. It is ink on board and it was formerly a grand prize winner for the Trail of Tears art show at the Cherokee Heritage Center. Um, in this art piece, you'll see that Cherokee artist Roy Boney depicts uh, Andrew Jackson with a almost a zombified <laughs> type of presence um, with, uh, with, with almost soulless eyes, no eyes. And um, the Indian Removal Act, which was spurred by, by Andrew Jackson and enacted in 1830, um, that legislation was one of President Jackson's campaign promises. His disregard for tribal sovereignty in Indian nations is extreme, despite having had his life saved by Junaluska, a Cherokee warrior, during a battle. And he also adopted an orphan Creek survivor from a battlefield as his son. So despite these ties to Indian nations and despite owing his life to a Cherokee warrior, 
Andrew Jackson continued on with his promise to clear the uh, clear the lands of indigenous nations. And uh, he is remembered in Cherokee Nation and throughout the Southeast for these for these heinous and for these heinous actions. Depicted here is a political cartoon. At its head, Andrew Jackson is, is Andrew Jackson, who vowed to honor no federal treaty obligations and who served as the architect of Indian removal in uh, 1830. So seated on a horse, uh, there is also Martin Van Buren, who was the president that actually carried out the Indian removal that took place after Andrew Jackson's presidency. Uh, he's cross-legged there behind him. Next is a devil playing the fiddle, followed by a mounted officer whose horse is one of two drawing a wagon holding caged Indians with a flag that reads, Rights of Man and a Liberty Cap. Inside the cage, a forlorn Indian sings, Home, Sweet Home. The newly delineated Indian territory had been reduced to the borders of present-day Oklahoma, and thousands of Indians were forcibly relocated counter to American jurisprudence, including Choctaws who left Mississippi in the winter of 1831, Creeks who began leaving Alabama in 1836, um, and, and a very tragic story uh, during the Creek removal was that a steamboat foundered and there were 311 men who were chained to that steamboat who drowned in that process because they were they were chained to that boat and, and completely unable to escape. So I, I've talked about a little about resistance prior to removal. Um, this is another example of resistance as well. So in response to the removal efforts, the Cherokee Nation, led by Chief John Ross, mounted a written protest of the illegally executed Treaty of New Echota. It was signed by unlawful representatives of Cherokee Nation who had no authority to actually cede Cherokee lands. The protest was signed by, signed by thousands of Cherokees, and it was bound end to end and sent to the government in Washington. So despite these efforts and despite the huge Cherokee outcry and despite the fact that that treaty was signed by unlawful representatives of Cherokee Nation, um, it, removal did move forward. So these acts of resistance included individual Cherokees planting their corn in 1838, sure, knowing for sure that they would be there to reap that harvest. Yet it was individuals like uh, like the Brandons from the memoir that I read from earlier who were there to actually reap that harvest that was sown by Cherokees who were displaced through removal. Now, not everyone was in favor of removal. We do see prominent Americans like Ralph Waldo Emerson who are writing on behalf of the Cherokee people and who are standing against removal. So as removal was imminent, we began seeing horrible travesties taking place. Um, General Winfield Scott was placed in charge of the force removal. He pledged to have every man, woman, and child on the move before the next moon passes. He also promised dire consequences for those who run or resist. He promised a full-fledged war. And that is pretty much what was delivered. In the Snowbird community, I stood there on the mountaintop with, uh, with people who have passed down these stories of oral history. And one of the folks there from the Snowbird community in North Carolina told me about how instead of following the path down the mountain, which was a safe established path, the army clear cut a straight path down the side of the mountain because they thought it would take too long to have the people follow the mountain path. That is how, uh, that, that is how energetic the individuals who were in charge of removal were about making sure that indigenous nations were cleared from the southeastern United States. 
For the Cherokee people, at least, there were four detachments. Uh, Stephen Foreman and his wife, Sarah Riley, were rounded up to Camp Hetzel and embarked on the Trail of Tears to arrive in Oklahoma. Along the way, Sarah gave birth to a child. Because these movements took place over months, it, it, was, it was an extended um, it, was, it was an extended journey. There were times when they were traveling and the, the waterways were so choked with ice that they had to wait for, the, for it to clear so they could cross. Times when, um, so along that way, as I mentioned, Sarah gave birth to a child and that was one of 19 children that were born on that detachment's journey, according to records provided from that time. The Cherokee removal was the cruelest work I knew. So as forced removal began in 1838, stockades were built. Cherokees were forced to stockades from their homes, fields, places of business. Um, as they left their homes, um, if they were not taken possession of by an individual who had laid claim to them, then they were pillaged by looters. For the Cherokee alone, as many as one quarter of the population died en route to Indian Territory. In reviewing the muster rolls and other accompanying documents, Jerry Clark, a historian retired from the National Archives, um, pointed out to me that, and he is a Cherokee person, he pointed out to me that the ages of the individuals who were lost in this, in, in this, in this forced migration were our oldest and they were our youngest. So we lost so many elders and we lost so many babies and so many children along this way. The amount of cultural knowledge and cultural legacy that failed to be passed on because of the, those lost elders is absolutely immeasurable and incalculable. And those children who were lost, um, you know, the future of Cherokee Nation cut short um, through, through this horrible, horrible forced migration. So soldiers did capture most Cherokees. Uh, the first contingent began mid-June 1838, and there were many who died prior to removal due to conditions in the stockades. In those first groups, there were individuals who died of exposure to heat and heat stroke, inadequate, uh, inadequate provisions, um, inadequate shelter, and the, the, the simple pace of having to cover so many miles per day in weakened conditions after being housed in the stockade in, in poor conditions. I've shared many stories from Cherokee Nation because those are the stories that I know, those are the stories that have been told to me. But there are stories from other Southeastern Indian nations that stay with me as well, of Choctaw women from a community walking through and stroking the leaves trying to carry with them some sense memory as they are leaving behind an area that they believe they will never be able to see again. Wildcat, as Seminole, said upon his surrender to U.S. Army officers in 1858, and again, Seminoles were uh, an unconquerable people who evaded capture for a number of years. So you notice that time, 1858, 28 years after the Indian Removal Act. When I was a boy, I saw the white man afar off and told he was my enemy. I could not shoot him as a wolf or a bear, yet he came upon me. My horses and fields he took from me. He said he was my friend. He gave me his hand in friendship. I took it. He had a snake in the other. I've talked about the way they clear cut the mountain to try and push Cherokee people out as fast as possible. I've told you about the 311 Creek men who died in chains because the steamboat foundered. There are so many stories about removal and upon arrival in Indian territory having faced unimaginable hardships, many Indian nations tried to rebuild and did so. Cherokee Nation in particular unified their governments, established a public school system that was so advanced, uh, white neighbors actually sent their children to our schools. Um, 
we had one of the first institutes of higher learning for women west of the Mississippi, and our male and female seminaries boasted equal pay for male and female teachers in a time when that was unheard of. However, we continue to live with the legacy of removal, and we continue to tell these stories so that way we remember the ones that were lost along the way and the way that removal impacted us as we look around our adopted homelands uh, in what is currently Oklahoma. I appreciate being here today, and I appreciate the invitation from uh, to, to take part in this teacher in institute. And I say, now I'm thanking you all. Candessa, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us today. And we look forward to working with you again in the future. Next, I want to introduce all of you to Salish educator, Julie Kachun, who is a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. She grew up in the homeland of her Salish ancestors, who have belonged to this land since time immemorial. She served her community as a teacher and a school administrator, and also worked as a curriculum specialist for her tribe and as adjunct faculty at the Salish Kootenai College. Julie's work on indigenous history materials confront the absence, myth, and stereotype of the master narrative of US history. She's a creative and multi-talented professional and her works have been produced on film, text, multimedia, and in theater. I've had the good pleasure of listening to a beautiful CD, um, The Heart of the Bitterroot, which tells Salish and Ponderé stories, and it's, it's just beautiful, so I recommend it. Julie, thank you for joining us. Stemflu flu spuus. What's in your heart? I extend my traditional greetings to you, Renee, and to all of the educators watching this session. Julie Kajun Flu East West. My name is Julie Kajun, and I'm a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Today, I'm going to be exploring with you the story of the General Allotment Act of 1887. From time immemorial, tribal nations governed themselves and their homelands. To Native people, land was everything. It was our home, it was our church, it was our medicine, it was our store. But this was to drastically change. First with the arrival of colonizing European nations and later with the emerging United States and its policy of manifest destiny. Tribal homelands were taken through conquest and war, and the treaty-making process that ended in 1871. Establishing Indian reservations through the treaty process was both an effective land acquisition strategy, and it was an answer to the Indian problem. The Indian problem was that we persisted, along with our cultures, languages, and spiritual practices we did not assimilate. Indian reservations were a neat solution that sequestered Indian people from the settler populations. Reservations kept Indians mostly out of the way and out of sight. But something more had to be done, according to Senator Henry Dawes. Senator Dawes believed that Indians we're multiplying and doing well with reservation life, and we weren't assimilating. Reservations were sheltering us, and something more had to be done. Sheltering care of reservation life? Well, hardly. For many tribes, being confined to reservations introduced them to a poverty that they hadn't known before. Civilized life? My tribal nation had a sophisticated society where women and children were treasured and valued and protected. They were not considered chattel or property. Our values and traditions were such that we had no need for jails and prisons. We were a very civilized society. 
But Senator Dawes wanted to fit the Indian into a lifestyle he was familiar and comfortable with. He wanted to assimilate Indian people into mainstream American culture by making them farmers and ranchers, coaxing them into a sheltered, settled style. Now, how did he think this could be done? Well, he had a policy in mind and it was shared by others and it was bluntly stated by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1876. It is doubtful whether a degree of civilization is possible without individual ownership of land. So the thinking follows that if Indian families were landowners, they would begin ranching and farming in earnest. Subsistence lifestyles would give way to more civilized agricultural pursuits. Alice Fisher, who is called the mother of allotment and who helped conceive allotment policy, believed that allotment was going to be the Magna Carta for Indian people, that it was going to liberate us. And allotment then became the championed strategy to civilize the Indians. In 1887, the General Allotment Act was passed. At times it's called the Dawes Act in reference to its passionate advocate. The story of allotment is a story of corruption and greed. On my reservation, it's also a story of resilience and vision. The Allotment Act provided for the survey of reservation lands. Surveyed lands would then be divided into individual allotments. These would be selected or assigned to tribal members. Heads of household would get a quarter section or 160 acres. Single adults would get an eighth section or 80 acres. Tribal members under 18 would get a 16th section or 40 acres. Allotments were to be held in trust for 25 years. Now trust property cannot be sold and it is not taxed. Well, at the end of 25 years, the trust land would be transferred to fee simple land and the owner could lease it, sell it to anyone and it would be taxed. But there was more to the Allotment Act than civilizing Indians through land ownership and shifting economies to farming and ranching. Indeed, there was a key provision that had nothing to do with the original intent, as stated by the Act's most fervent proponents. Section 5 of the General Allotment Act provided that after lands were allotted to all tribal members, if, in the opinion of the President, it shall be in the best interest of that tribe to negotiate with the tribe for the purchase and release of the leftover lands, the surplus lands for 160 acre homesteads for settlers. When with the loss of reservation land and the influx of homesteaders be in the best interest of any tribe. So this key piece of allotment had nothing to do with assimilating Indians into farming and ranching. It had everything to do with getting reservation lands, lands reserved by treaty law, the supreme law of the land as stated in Article 6 of the United States Constitution. Let's take a look at the immediate impacts across Indian country. At the time of the Allotment Act, there were 138 million acres of reservation lands. Right after the Allotment Act and the opening up of surplus lands, 78 million acres of reservation lands. Then there were amendments to the Allotment Act. After those were passed, 48 million acres of reservation lands. Allotment amendments included things like the Dead Indian Act, where an inherited allotment could be sold even though it was still in trust. 
The Burke Act created a shortcut to transfer allotments from trust status to fee simple land. That was done if a tribal member was deemed competent, intelligent, reliable enough to manage their own business. So they actually had competence hearings. Now remember that trust land was not subject to taxation and it could not be sold. But when it was transferred to fee, it was subject to taxes, it could be leased, it could be sold to anyone, it could be lost to taxes not paid or to debts. There was a tribal member, a Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal member serving in World War I who was home on leave. And the provisions of the Burke Act were going to transfer his land to fee status by putting him through a competency hearing. Well, he knew that if his land went into fee status, he might lose it to taxes. So he hired a lawyer to fight this. Well, the Indian agent said, well, if you hired a lawyer, you're obviously competent. And so his land was transferred into fee status. And when he was back serving his country during World War I, his allotment was lost to taxes. So what was the end result of the General Allotment Act? Well, by 1934, 90 million acres of reservation lands were sold and transferred to non-Indians. In 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act was passed and that stopped the allotment process. It also returned any remaining surplus lands back to tribal holdings. Nationwide, that left 48 million remain acres of reservation land. But half of these lands weren't suitable for agriculture. They consisted of desert or semi-desert land. The prime agricultural land was lost. So much for the stated intent to make Indians become farmers and ranchers. As history reveals, allotment hardly proved the Magna Carta for Indian people. But let's take a look at allotment and its impact on a specific tribal nation, on my tribal nation. This is a map of my reservation, the Flathead Indian Reservation in Northwestern Montana, as reserved in the 1855 of Hellgate. Article one talks about the reservation boundaries in Article 2, as shown here, says that this reservation was set apart exclusively for the use and benefit of our tribes as an Indian reservation. And it goes on to say, nor shall any white man, excepting those in the employment of the Indian department, be permitted to reside there. This is my homeland, the Flathead Indian Reservation home to the Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenai tribes. Historically, the Salish were referred to as flatheads by people like Lewis and Clark. However, there is really no such tribe. That's a misnomer, but that name remains for a reservation, our lake, and our river. This is my beautiful homeland. Each reservation required the passage of a specific bill for its allotment. Montana Senator Joseph Dixon led the political charge to see the Flathead Indian Reservation allotted. And he was joined by powerful Montana businessmen, many of whom he was related to. So the treaty only recognized 12 million acres of our over 20 million acre Aboriginal territory. Our tribal members believed the words of the treaty. They believed that we were establishing a permanent tribal homeland. And so when allotment was brought up, our tribal leaders vocally resisted and opposed it. Chief Charlo led delegations to Washington, D.C. to oppose allotment. Sam Resurrection utilized an interpreter to write letters of protest, but their protests fell on deaf ears. Allotment backers used Article 6 with an obscure reference to the Omaha Treaty 
to convince people sympathetic to our position, to the tribe's position, to move forward with allotment. The Flathead Allotment Act was passed in 1904. Now recall that the original intent was to civilize Indians through the adoption of agricultural lifestyles. Well, tribal members were already engaging in farming and ranching pursuits by necessity. Confinement made subsistence living almost impossible. The ability to move freely to leave the reservation to go hunting, it was regulated by the Indian agent and required a pass, which may or not be granted. And Montana settlers were not keen to see Indian people, and they were constantly pressuring politicians to keep Indians in the confines of the reservation. So tribal members began ranching and ran herds of cattle and horses in common, utilizing the vast valley floors of the reservation. In 1904, there were 28,000 head of cattle, 20,000 head of horses on the reservation, and 30,000 acres were in cultivation. And people had already developed their own irrigation systems. So people were already engaging in agriculture. In fact, right before allotment, there were a lot of tribal members that were on the verge of self-sufficiency, and some were realizing a level of wealth. So let's go through a visual timeline of the impacts of allotment on the Flathead Indian Reservation. So here we start with the reservation as reserved in the Hellgate Treaty, one and a quarter million acres of tribal land. These maps are color-coded and green indicates tribal land. Now we look to the next map and we see where the orange part, and those are the allotments for tribal members. There was about 230,000 acres allotted. Okay, now as in the General Allotment Act and the Flathead Allotment Act, there is a provision. After all tribal members are allotted, the remaining land, the surplus land, will be disposed of on the, under the general provisions of the Homestead Act. So, surplus lands were opened in 1910 by a presidential proclamation. After three rounds of allotment, over 400,000 acres of reservation land were lost to homesteaders. If you've ever seen the old black and white movies about westerns where they have the land rush that's what it was like as you can see in this photograph it was a mini land rush on a reservation and now that let's look at what that looks like actually on a map so if you can see on the western and eastern border of the reservation map that's the tribal land all of the other land there's some orange allotments and then there's some gray and lighter colors that is fee land, that is reservation land that was lost. And you see that purple color, that's 18,000 acres of land that was taken for the bison range. Now those gray pieces of land are state sections that were taken to support schools. So you can see that we lost almost 60% of our reserved land base. So in addition to losing the land, that had great impacts. We had 28,000 head of cattle. Those decreased to under 7,000. We lost the valley floor for grazing, and so people had to sell their cattle and horse herds. And the market was flooded at that time, and so they sold them far below market values. Well, what else had to be sold? The Pablo Allard bison herd. A tribal member had brought some orphan calves and grew a bison herd to between five and 600. Now, they ranged along the Flathead River, but when the valley floor was lost, the Pablo Allard herd had to be rounded up and sold. Some of the last land that we lost was along Flathead Lake. The south half of Flathead Lake is part of our reservation. It's the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. Today, that lake shore sells by the foot, and those villa sites that were sold are now multi-million dollar properties. And today, there's very few places that tribal members can enjoy the lake or go swimming 
because almost all of that lakeshore is privately owned. There was a second round of allotments that were done in 1922. These were called the timber allotments because all of the agricultural land, and you can see on a map where these are, in the brown pieces, those are the second allotments. Well, there wasn't really any agricultural use to that land, and most of those allotments today are gone now. The prime land was gone. Now, I told you that this story of allotment, the General Allotment Act and the Flathead Allotment Act and all of the other allotment acts for reservations are really a story of corruption and greed and getting land. But on our reservation, it was also a story of resilience and vision. And our tribe began a very aggressive land purchase policy. And that started in 1918. And we have acquired back over 300,000 acres of the land that was lost when our reservation was opened up to homesteading. Today, the tribes own approximately 60% of the reservation land base. So as early as 1918, the tribes started purchasing back land. And today, there is a land reserve fund, and they still purchase, are purchasing land. Here's what our reservation looks like today. And you can see the green, remember green is tribal land. And a lot of that green is in critical habitat area because our tribes are stewards, not just for people, the land and people, but for other communities. We purchase grizzly bear habitat and riparian zones. And our tribe is actually known internationally for our environmental policy. We established a tribal wilderness on the east side of the reservation in the Mission Mountains. We have class one air quality. We set our own water quality standards. We introduced species like the trumpeter swan, the peregrine falcon. We have a buffer zone for grizzly bears. And so we are one of the few tribal nations to be known internationally for our environmental policy. And we are one of the few tribal nations who has been able to recover so much of our reservation land that was lost to a lot in homesteading. And at a great cost, because when we purchase our land, we are purchasing it at current market prices. Now, remember that big purple piece of land on the map here? It's now outlined in red. That was the 18,000 acres taken for the bison range. Well, that land was returned to tribal holdings as part of our water compact that was signed into law in December of 2020. So what have the impact of allotment been? Well, we now have tribal government dealing with county government, dealing with city government, dealing with state government, and that brings about complicated jurisdictional issues. Tribal members, we are the minority population on our own reservation. It is very hard to get tribal representation on school boards or municipal or county seats and non-tribal members are constantly pushing back on tribal management of natural resources, even though they enjoy the benefits of our environmental policy. And the issues go on, but we persist. I would like to conclude with the vision and mission statement of our tribe. Our tribes are investing in our people, but we're also investing in our homeland and trying to recover and restore our homelands and really be determining our own destiny, self-determination, and that vision has restored our, our homeland to a majority of tribal holdings. And we, our mission statement says that we will strive to regain ownership of all the lands within our reservation boundaries and preserve and protect it. So our story started with loss, but it's a story of resilience and, and vision. And I am very proud of our tribal leaders in reserving our homeland that was a place where we had lived since time immemorial. And when that land, that small reserve piece was lost, so much of it was lost, that our tribal leaders had the vision and the commitment to restore that. And so I'm very proud of that leadership. I'm proud of that vision and that commitment in our environmental stewardship. 
and flexing our sovereign muscle to determine who we are as a nation and how we will live and how we will govern ourselves and our homeland. So I'm very proud to be a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And I'm very thankful for having the opportunity to share this story with you and have time to tell you just a small part of history, how that affected tribes nationally, but how that affected my own community. So I will close with a picture of our flag and remind you that tribes are sovereign nations. And I would say Lem Lem Pesia. Julie, Candessa, I wanna thank you both so much for your presentations because it's clear that while these are very difficult chapters in our history, your visual presentation and the primary sources that you brought into the presentations, it's, it's evident through the memoirs and the photographs that you shared that this is a, such a vital part of your history and still um, has reverberations today. So it's clear still that deep relationships and belonging to the land are vital to Native nations today as they were yesterday. And Julie, you actually wrote an essay for us in our Native Knowledge 360 lesson. And in that um, lesson titled, How Native American Nations Experience Belonging, you wrote, the histories of Plains Native nations extend far beyond the reservation borders of today. Sacred and important sites, of which many are ancient, speak to a relationship that these Native peoples have with the land. And you describe that when you talk about the land being a store and medicines and your stories. And after living within these sacred landscapes for many generations, they've developed a deep sense of belonging to place. So Julie, I'm wondering if you can please describe, you showed some beautiful pictures of your homeland, but can you talk about what it means to be from there as a tribal member and with hundreds of generations of history and family that surrounds you? You know, I, I consider it a, a privilege, a, a responsibility, and a great blessing that I live in the land where my Salish relatives have always lived from time immemorial. So when I'm driving around or up in the mountains or somewhere, I'm looking at landscapes that are part of our creation story. And so I'm seeing where Coyote did a certain thing, or I'm at Lolo Creek, Tumsumfli, where there's no salmon, or I'm at the beginning of the Bitterroot Valley, where the place where you held your horses back because they knew they were going home. So they're all, all of our place names are like stories and love poems on our landscape. And we reserve this small part of that, but it's so magnificent. Um, the eastern border of our reservation are the Mission Mountains of the Rocky Mountain chain. There's a 93,000 tribal wilderness there. The grizzly bears go through there. Um, white bark pine is there, which is a keystone species, a really important tree. Uh, the lower Flathead River flows through the heart, right through the center of our reservation. That's where my mother grew up. Um, and so, and there are all these stories of places, the mountains were a vision questing place, and so was the river. But it it's, was a land, it is a land of such beauty and abundance. And in this large landscape, you know, we didn't need anything. We had everything. We had everything that we needed. And so for me, there's some places that are so familiar that it's, it's a deep affection that you have with that place. And where you go there, you feel like you recognize each other. For my mother, it was a certain place on the river because she grew up there and learned to swim there. And she said, it's like you're seeing an old friend when you go back. And so there are places like that that, that are um, important places. I got to bring my grandson to the medicine tree, which is outside of our reservation, but we purchased some acreage there to protect that. It's a prayer place. We still go there several times a year. So I brought my grandson with me for the first time. And it, you know, and so here I am in this place where my relatives have for generations made their prayers. And now I'm there with my grandson. And so I, I consider that such a privilege. And I'm so proud of 
my tribal leaders of their management and their care for that place, because it's not just our home. You know, it's all of these other communities that live there. And so we have to consider that too, particularly now that we are all in the most desperate um, time to save this beautiful planet that has cared for us. And we know that we have to give back. And so we have a climate change plan and we are actively involved, um, our natural resource department in actions. We have 44 wildlife crossings that protect animals. So they're, they're uh, these huge underground crossings that go under the highways. Bears use them, otters use them, wild turkeys, <laughs> mountain lions. And so it's, I just am really proud of what we've done. I went with one of the game rangers or wildlife biologists and a game ranger, Whisper Camel Means and Peyton Adams, and they explained all the tracks and how much these corridors are now used. And it's really mitigated wildlife mortality on the highway. So I, I live in this magnificent, magnificent country that's a remnant of where my people have always lived. That's amazing. I mean, those, not only all the work you've done, but I, I feel like I'd be remiss not to, to thank um, the Salish and Kootenai people because I was allowed to go on um, your reservation and, and was able to visit with a Salish woman there. And it was such a privilege. Um, and, and Candessa, you know, Northeast Oklahoma, we have rolling hills there in Northeast Oklahoma, but you talked about going on Snowbird Mountain in North Carolina and that visual that you gave us of um, clear cutting the forest, it, you know, will really stick with me personally. And I'm wondering if you can tell us more about how the Cherokee people today talk about your homelands. <clears throat> so I am the sixth generation in my family in what is currently Oklahoma. And when I go visit North Carolina, they say, welcome home. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, that, that struck me really deeply uh, the first time I went there. And uh, a friend of mine who has uh, since passed on, uh, Becky Jigesa, Jigesa means like their time has passed. Um, she told me, she said, I'm going to come visit you <laughs> uh, where you live. Uh, because they wanted to come visit uh, uh, some of the ceremonial grounds that we have here in Oklahoma. And she was a North Carolina Cherokee. And uh, I told her, I said, sister, when you see where they sent us, you're going to cry. Because it is like a photocopy <laughs> um, of, of the mountains. But we don't have mountains. We have ridges and we have hills. Um, the Solomon seal that grows in North Carolina, big and strong because of the climate in North Carolina grow. There's a much, much smaller version that grows here. Um, in North Carolina, they have ramps because they're at a higher elevation and ramps in Cherokee are called Wasti or Washti in uh, Eastern Bend dialect. And they actually help bring down your blood pressure. But we don't have those in, where we are in Oklahoma. So that uh, so we actually eat wild onions in the spring instead of uh, wasp, instead of wasp thing. So our, our, we have made the best of what we have here in our new adopted homelands. And there are many Cherokee people in Oklahoma who do think of our adopted homelands as, as homelands, because for many of us, you know, we're sixth and seventh generation um, in, in what is currently Oklahoma. Um, there are still many families who are living on their allotments is, uh, you know, uh, referencing back to, to Julie's presentation. So, um, so while we definitely view these as homelands, we have ceremonial grounds that are over a hundred years old that have been continuously used for dancing. Um, you know, I, when, when we go home to our homelands in North Carolina and we see the flora and fauna that, uh, the fauna, especially 
or I mean, sorry, the flora, especially that are almost like supersized versions of what we have here in Oklahoma. Um, it is, uh, it, it, it really, um, it, it really strikes a chord deep somewhere in, in kind of your blood memory when you see those things. Yeah. And, you know, you've adapted with the green onions and things, but I bet it is really powerful to, to go back and see the plants that are familiar, but different and bigger. And, you know, the climate is obviously very different, but you, you still have maintained these relationships with, with plants and, and made new traditions. And I know worked really hard to keep those ceremonial grounds going. Mm -hmm. um, Julie, can you provide a specific example um, Candace brought up language. Can you talk a little bit about how language shapes ties to land or vice versa? Well, there's so many different ways. You know, number one, um, you know, we say that we're Salish, which is a language family. And so Ponderé, Salish, Coeur d'Alene, Kalispell, Spokane, you know, there's a lot of those tribes are very close to us in our, our language. We can understand each other's language. But the Salish goes all the way to the coast, the language, and even into Canada. I heard some Canadian Salish women speaking, and I recognized some of the, the names. And I said, you're from a Salish language family. And they said, yes. So, you know, we call ourselves Salish, which is, you know, a, a general term. And, but then we had specific terms, and a more specific term would be scaly. And that, people say, oh, that means the people. But it does not. It means the flesh of the land. And so our more intimate name of who we are literally is saying that we are the people of, of this land. We're the flesh of this land. But our place names, you know, I, I, I traveled for months with two fluent speakers going in all of our Aboriginal territory um, and, and talking about place names, the Muscle Shell River. There are place names, a day's ride on a horse because that was Buffalo country. And that, and that place is called um, Eyes Wide Openwood River because of the diamond willow that grows there. And if you peel that bark off the wood, it looks like there are eyes all over the wood. So, uh, you know, all of the place names in our language, which are some of the oldest words in our language, tell about our creation. And so it's a different way to look at a landscape when you think that it connects you back before human beings were here, when, when the spirits were here and the animal people were here getting everything ready for us. So it connects you back to that time, some of those words. Thank you for sharing. Um, Candessa, you know, maybe this is a little abrupt, but kind of returning back to the challenges that affected the Cherokee when you got to Indian territory, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that. For example, one of the most common questions that we get at the museum, you know, people just kind of easily say, you know, the treaties were all broken. Um, were the promises made by the government, you know, after um, the treaties, were they upheld? And can you talk a little bit more about that? <clears throat> well, they promised to remove Cherokees from the uh, southeastern United States, and they definitely followed through on that. They weren't completely successful because, of course, we do have our our uh, our, our sister nation. Um, you know, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians who are still there in North Carolina, uh, still upholding our, upholding and protecting our sacred sites there. So um, one, one thing that a lot of people don't know about removal is that Cherokee people were actually charged for all of the expenses related to removal uh, because there was a land payment that was made um, because there was not a, a full equity um, for lands in the West and lands in the East. There, it wasn't necessarily an equal exchange. So uh, there was a payment made to Cherokee people, and the expenses of the forced removal were extracted from that payment before it was made to, to Cherokee people. So we essentially paid, uh, paid for our own removal. 
um, the the challenges. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, there had been Cherokees who had immigrated uh, to um, west of the Mississippi to what is uh, now Oklahoma, what is currently Oklahoma. And, and so we had to unify those governments. And there was an act of unification uh, shortly after the end of the Trail of Tears. However, um, in, in real human terms, um, there is a story that was shared by Cherokee elder Tom Belt. Um, there was a vast diversity of experiences on removal. So those earlier contingents that were held in the stockades who were, um, you know, marched without being able to really collect their items. There are stories of an individual, of, of a family where um, an individual family member had, had actually died and they had laid that person out for burial and they were unable to complete that burial. They had to leave their, their deceased loved one um, essentially on, you know, at their cabin as they were rounded up for removal. So there, there's vast diversity of experiences as opposed to people under the later regiments who were Cherokee led, who were able to bring some of their belongings with them. Um, Cherokee elder Tom Belt tells a story of uh, when the big wooden spoons and uh, forks were in a fashion in the 70s that people were hanging on their walls uh, that his parents said they absolutely would never have anything like that hanging in their hanging in their home because it reminded them of the period after removal um, when uh, people had nothing and they actually had to carve um, utensils out of wood and that was all they had. So, so those, those reverberations, um, and you know, there's some government promises that were kept in terms of removing individuals, uh, from the Southeastern United States. And then there were others that, you know, for instance, the Cherokee land patent that was granted or not granted, but that was issued under president Martin Van Buren held that these lands in what is currently Oklahoma would be held by Cherokee people as long as the grass grow, grew and the water flowed. And uh, they, they definitely did not uphold that promise. You know, I hear so many similarities, Candessa, with our, some of our Shawnee stories about, you know, running out of food, you know, that was promised during the removal and Shawnee families having to go and hunt and, and even feed the, some of the removal agents. So there's, there's definitely a, um, a lot of connection I'm hearing and, and another connection, you know, that my family has is that we, you know, have our allotment in Oklahoma. It's very small today. My grandmother has seven acres now. And once you divide that by five children, you know, it just gets smaller and smaller. Um, and so, so many reservations are checkerboard. And I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit um, about, Candessa, about the Oklahoma lands and the tribes there, because you mentioned, um, a few times that when people, um, these 28 to 33 tribes that were forcibly removed to Oklahoma, depending on how you count them, um, were, were forced there, they were being put on other people's land. So can you talk a little bit more about um, the checkerboarding in, in Cherokee lands? Oh, yeah, I, I think this ties in somewhat, and I, I believe that Julie can also speak to this as well. Um, so when um, so when allotment happened, and allotment did happen uh, in, in Oklahoma, um, there was there was resistance to allotment from ceremonial leaders that were known as the Nighthawk to a society, um, and individuals who were of a higher blood quantum um, were in restricted status, meaning that they were not able to actually. Um, determine what they wanted done with their lands, uh, that they actually had to, um, as recently as, you know, within the last five years, a friend of mine, his grandfather had to appear before a judge to prove that he was of sound mind and was able to actually distribute his property upon his death to his own children um, in the manner that he saw fit. So, uh, so we see, you know, we see this diversity of experience with individuals who are higher blood quantum and then individuals of lower blood quantum who did not have any kind of, um, 
you know, they there are some who fell prey to to grifters and to people who had criminal intentions to to take their lands. Um, I I I I'm friends with uh, several individuals who are are seminal. And they have told me stories of a doctor in the uh, in the area uh, around around Seminole, Oklahoma, who the the Seminole people knew that if they were sick or if someone was you know needed to have their baby delivered or if they needed some kind of help, they had fallen on hard times that they could go see this doctor, and all they had to do was sign their name, and the doctor would help them. Well, in reality, what was happening was they were signing over their allotments and they were signing over their lands in exchange for groceries or in exchange for medical care or in exchange for payment of medicines. And, uh, and, and this doctor amassed quite a, quite a bit of land enough to build a, a mansion for a Seminole girl who he married. And I believe she uh, disappeared. Uh, no one knows really what happened what happened to his first, uh, his first seminal wife. So, so when we look at, at stories like that in what is currently Oklahoma, um, those stories, uh, I can speak more, more, uh, more to the experiences on the Eastern half of the state. Um, those stories in regard to how people lost their lands and how people lost their allotment lands are, are, are fairly common. In addition to these stories about individuals who, are, are unable to um, do what they want with their own lands that they have title to because they're in restricted status. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and Julie, when we talked before, you mentioned that, and this stuck with me, that the Salish are a minority on their own reservation. Can you tell us a little bit more, um, and, and fairly briefly, though, about your family um, and, and a personal connection that reverberates today for you? Well, today, you know, we are the minority population on our own reservation, and uh, it makes it difficult. So we live next to non-Indian people who came in under homesteading, who got land very cheap. Um, the money that they did get for that land went into building an irrigation project. Our money that should have the tribe should have been able to decide what happened with it. It built an irrigation project that primarily serves non-Indians and has historically served non-Indian ranchers and farmers. And so it, it, it becomes very complicated, a checkerboard reservation where you have white people and Indian people living next to each other, sometimes very politically opposed, sometimes good neighbors, but sometimes not. So for me, as, as a teacher working on my own reservation in a school with over 60% Indian students, um, I am the only Indian teacher in that school. There is no Indian on the school board. And so this is what happens in reservations that were opened to homesteading is you have these two communities living side by side. And sometimes it creates a very political and socially contentious situation. Um, the ACLU actually did represent two tribal members who ran for school board and created a minority majority district. But there are hundreds of stories like that for reservations that are checkerboarded with non-Indian and tribally owned land. Thank you for sharing. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here because I'd love for both of you to, to, to share a final takeaway that you really hope that teachers and students um, walk away with, you know, after teachers hear the presentation and our conversation today, you know, what are the, the real salient points that you um, that come from your heart and that you want to share so that then they can be moved to teach this in their classrooms. Candessa, can we start with you? Sure, I will try and be brief. Uh, the I, I think if, if educators take away one thing, I, I really want people to um, to take away that this may be history, but it's not in the past. 
that all of these actions have reverberations that contemporary indigenous nations continue to deal with and continue to try and heal from. Um, these stories of historical trauma have led to intergenerational trauma that our, our communities are, are trying to still heal from. So, so there is a legacy to, to what has happened that, uh, that indigenous nations are, are still dealing with today. Um, and Julie, how about you? Any takeaways that, um, that you want to leave with teachers today? I want to um, thank Candessa for speaking her beautiful language and leave teachers with the fact that this has happened, but that Indian people have always acted with agency and that we are active forces in our lives and recovering and healing. And so I would hope that they would know that it wasn't just that these things happened, but that our leaders were visionary and still today. And I think that's evidenced um, by Candessa's use of her language and in a lot of the stories that we told. Yes, thank you both so much. This has been such a moving and enlightening conversation. And um, Candessa will have to share some Cherokee language re resources because we had a, a really um, great talk about that. And, um, and Julie will want to share all of the NK360 resources that you have so graciously helped us with. So Niawe, thank you both so much for your time today. Len well, Thank you, Niawe. Now let's take a quick look at tomorrow's program where NMAI's former director, who is now the undersecretary of the Smithsonian, Kevin Gover, will be speaking about Indian reorganization termination and self-determination. Additionally, my colleague from NK360, Colleen Smith, will share classroom ready resources from the museum's Native Knowledge 360 program that relate to everything we've talked about during our time together over the past few days. Thank you, Mia Wei, and have a great rest of your day.